Greetings to my fellow peace blunders and welcome to my second video in the Scandinavian defense series, this time covering Queen to d6 on move 3, also known as the Gubinski Melts defense. If you're looking for some Queen a5 material, go to my previous video, the link will be in the upper right corner. And although we're looking at things from Black's perspective, I'll be offering a balanced view and providing the best moves and ideas for both sides. So this video should be useful not only for learning how to play the Scandinavian, but also how to play against the Scandinavian. A little disclaimer, I cannot physically cover every single move that can happen on a board, we can't be just sitting here all day. And if you just so happen to find this video useful, please like and subscribe, I think we'd benefit from seeing each other more often, wouldn't we? And last but not least, please remember that when learning an opening, don't just blindly memorize all the moves there are, the most important thing is to understand the key ideas and principles. All right. I hope you guys are ready and let's go. It should come as no surprise that we're starting with e4 and with our Viking hats on, we're raging into battle with d5, launching the Scandinavian. Pawn takes, queen takes, knight c3 attacking the queen, and now we have a choice of three retreating squares which are considered good. Last time we looked at queen to a5, which is the main line, and my personal strong recommendation, because I find this move the most effective to play for black. Today, however, we're looking at a more modest queen to d6. Don't get me wrong, I do not think that this move is necessarily bad, just as I don't think that there is much wrong with queen to d8 either. My personal belief is that white has more sensible ways of fighting queen d6 than queen a5, hence making black's preparation job more difficult. On top of that, there is one specific line for white that I would recommend playing for white because it pretty much forces a substantial advantage. But let's retrace our steps a little bit and figure out why you would play queen d6 as opposed to queen a5. And the answer is twofold really. First of all, we'd like to avoid our queen being harassed via d3 and bishop to d2. And second, a lot of players feel that the queen is doing a much better job holding the position together being centralized like this, as opposed to being on a flank. This reasoning is honestly solid, however, with queen on d6, we're opening ourselves up to completely new ways of spanking, for example, bishop f4 or knight to b5. Not to mention, queen on d6 usually hinders the development of the dark squid bishop, which in many main lines would otherwise go to b4. That's why, in many queen d6 positions, you'll find yourself in kettering that bishop instead, which doesn't always do good for the solidity of your king's Side. For now, let's crack on with our standard sequence of moves d4, knight f6, and knight f3. Now in this position, black is usually known to play one of the four following moves. a6, c6, g6, and bishop to g4. And as much as I, in the previous video, when we looked at queen to a5, slated the hell out of c6, with it being most of the time somewhat unnecessary here, in my opinion, c6 is the only move to play. If you're white, and on move 5 you don't see c6, and you see something else like g6, a6 or bishop to g4, you should be very happy. The alternatives are just much weaker. So before we look at c6, let me put the money where my mouth is and show you why the other three moves are inferior. Let's start with a6. Usually the goal of a6 is to prepare b5 later on as well as to prevent knight b5 from the opponent. On paper this sounds like a decent plan, however both of these things can still be achieved by c6 as well, but what c6 also does is that it helps helps control the d5 square and help black prevent any threads coming from the h1a8 diagonal. To exploit the latter and to play in the most efficient way against the a6 setup, why must play g3? Now g3 from white is a move that we will see occurring quite frequently in later positions as well, and interestingly enough, it doesn't always mean that white is going to put his bishop on g2. Quite often g3 will only serve as a precursor to bishop to f4 to threaten the queen, whilst the light squared bishop can still freely develop to d3, c4 or even e2 for that matter. Regardless, g3 and bishop b4 is one of the main thematic ideas for white to fight the queen d6 can Scandinavian, and now we'll have the traditional development of the light squared bishop before we play e6 as black, and g4 square will be the best square for it. And now to press his advantage, white should play a rather natural h3 challenging the bishop. And now both retreating and capturing for black are quite unpromising. If takes, retakes with the queen, and now as advertised, we're getting threats along the h1a8 diagonal. Now we play c6, something that should have been played in the first place, and now a6 looks a bit silly. The d4 4 pawn is now hanging, so white should defend it, bishop e3, e6 opening up the dark squared bishop, castles long, bishop e7 also preparing to castle, 
and this is where we're going to stop. As we can see, White's way of correctly handling the Scandinavian pretty much remained the same. Quickly castling long and then pushing the kingside pawns with g4 and h4 later on. White has more space, more developed pieces and the bishop pair which warrants him a comfortable advantage of 1.5. If we go back to h3 and see what happens after retreating to h5, now White can calmly fin care to his bishop to maybe create problems along the aforementioned diagonal again. Knight c6 developing and blocking the diagonal up a little bit and now White would be recommended to play d5, another signature move for White against the Scandinavian, questioning the c6 knight. Don't try to put your knight on e5 hoping to exchange some pieces, this will be a massive mistake for black. g4 attacking the bishop, the intermezzo capture on f3, queen recaptures, bishop retreats, castles, and in this position white is strategically just so much better, plus 3.5. So coming back, the best retreating square for the knight is b4. Now white keeps the pressure on with the typical in this position bishop f4 attacking the queen, queen c5 is most active and best, but now bishop e3 harassing the queen yet again, and after it retreats to the original d6, if you pay attention, after two moves, black's position has remained the same, whereas white has developed his bishop for free. On top of that, it's white's turn to move, so white develops another piece with queen to e2. By the way, queen to e2 also deserves special recognition in the Scandinavian because it's a very typical queen maneuver to prepare long castling. And although with queen to e2, we're dropping the d5 pawn after knight takes, knight takes, knight takes, white castles long with great initiative and after queen e6 getting rid of the pin, even with the pawn down, white stands much better, plus 1.5. This will conclude the breakdown of a6 on move 5 for black, the move that I again do not recommend. And now let's take a look at another move that I don't recommend, bishop to g4. I've said a couple of times by now in the last video and in this video that bishop does not belong on g4 in many lines of the Scandinavian. At the same time, bishop g4 can indeed be a valid move in a queen d6 Scandinavian, just not on move 5. Examples when bishop g4 is actually decent, I will show you later on. Now let's see how how white can punish the premature bishop g4 and it's no surprise that yet again after bishop g4 we see h3 attacking the bishop. If takes we'll see what we have seen in this video before queen takes and now threats along the h1 a8 diagonal are coming at us again. c6 blocking the threats and now bishop f4 attacking the queen and intentionally hanging the d4 pawn. Black should probably capture to at least get a pawn for his trouble but now comes the incredible knight to b5. The knight threatens the queen on d4 and also threatens knight c7 check with a 4. Capturing the knight c takes b5 is not the best move because here comes bishop takes b5 with check, knight bd7 blocking and now queen takes b7 threatening the rook, rook tries running to safety and to support the knight but here comes the devastating bishop c7 attacking the rook yet again and we're going to drop material. On top of that, especially after long castling at some point, Black's position will be incredibly difficult to defend, white is winning with plus 2.8. Okay, capturing the knight doesn't really appeal to us, so what is the best move? As you can probably guess, choosing the best move for black in this position is like choosing the lesser evil. Black is pretty much losing no matter what he does. With black pretty much bound to lose his a8 rook to the fork, the best idea is to gobble up as much material while you still can with queen takes b2. And here comes the promised fork with knight to c7 check, king d8, and now don't forget that the white rook on a1 is attacked, so we better move it, rook to d1 check, knight bd7 blocking, and now white can calmly capture the rook on a8, knight takes a8. Black is now a full rook down for just two pawns, and will eventually try to capture the a8 knight, but will have to untangle first with e5. It attacks the f4 bishop, and remember that e5 is not hanging because the queen is protecting it. Bishop goes back to d2, and now bishop d6 will conclude our analysis. We'd like to believe that the a8 knight will be captured at some point, and black will be able able to technically equalize the material, but having lost castling rights, being in exchange down for the price of two pawns and playing against the bishop pair, black's life will be quite difficult. The position is plus 2.3 for white. And now coming back to bishop g4 h3, if the bishop retreats to h5, we keep pushing with g4 attacking the bishop, the bishop retreats, and now g5 attacking the knight. And after knight d5, we'll be getting a very dynamic game. White will, in a quite traditional way for this line, Fianchetto with bishop via g2, and after a typical e6 
for black, white will castle kingside and will aim for an exciting position. And yes, some players would not like the fact that white's kingside is a bit overstretched, but the spatial advantage the pawns provide and white's superior development will give them a comfortable edge of plus one. Now, one last thing about bishop to g4 on move 5, the wrong way for white to capitalize on this move would be knight to b5 attacking the queen. Just because black didn't prevent knight to b5 doesn't mean it's a necessarily good move. After queen retreats to b6, black should not be afraid of any positions occurring afterwards. Probably the most instinctive way for white to continue is bishop f4 pressuring c7 and threatening the fork, but black has a nice antidote with knight to d5 attacking the bishop and defending c7 at the same time. Bishop goes back to g3 and now we can scare the knight away with a6. Knight goes back to c3, knight takes, pawn takes and now queen to a5 pressuring the weak pawn structure. The arising position is pretty much equal with just plus 0.2 for white. Okay, we're done with bishop to g4. Now it's time to look at the last move 5 for black that I do not recommend. g6, trying to fiend Keto the bishop. g6 also doesn't prevent knight to b5 and white may as well be tempted to play it yet again. However, in this position, knight to b5 is indeed the best move. As in most cases, the queen now retreats to b6. We have just seen how in a similar setup, bishop b4 fails to knight to d5. So white should refrain from that temptation move and go for the best strategic plan which is both queenside expansion and trying to harass the slightly misplaced black queen on b6 with a4. The best way to respond for black would be a6 attacking the annoying knight and creating the a7 square which may be very important for the queen later on. Also here I should mention that quite often when the black queen is situated on b6 the white knight from b5 wants to retreat to a3 not c3 and the idea is really simple from a3 the knight can go to c4 where it threatens the queen again bishop g7 finally fianchettoing and now knight c4 as advertised attacking the queen and queen a7 retreating to that nice square we've provided i know that the queen looks kind of awkward on a7 but trust me it's much better off here than let's say on c6 or e6 where it could be targeted yet again not to mention from a7 the queen still oversees this nice little diagonal we shouldn't be scared of any greedy attempts to trap the queen with say bishop to e3 yet again knight d5 successfully deals with that type of threat and equalizes the position instead you should expect the game to go a calmer route with something like bishop d3 developing castles castles bishop e6 also developing and attacking the c4 knight rook e1 developing and centralizing takes takes e6 and we have arrived at the final position and it feels like i'll be kind of repeating myself here but yet again white has the bishop pair has more space, slightly more developed, and black's queen is a bit awkward, white enjoys a nice advantage of plus 1.3. Okay, now when we have analyzed how white can capitalize on all the three inferior moves for black and why black shouldn't play these moves, let's turn our attention to the star of the show, c6. c6 eradicates most of the problems that we have faced in the lines that we've just analyzed or having to waste time playing c6 later on anyway when faced with trouble along the h1a8 diagonal. And as a bonus, as I stated previously, it helps control d5 and vacates the c7 square for the queen. And this is where I should give a fair warning and one of the reasons why I don't like queen to d6 to start with. Starting from this position, on move 6, on move 7 and on move 8, white has a wide wide range of really decent alternatives for example look at this very position and think of all the possible moves that white can play that are sensible bishop e2 bishop d3 bishop c4 bishop e3 knight e5 g3 just to name a few admittedly some of the lines will be transposing into each other after a couple of moves but still there are so many setups and variations and plans that white could go for and it's very easy easy for black to get lost amongst all of them. For the purposes of this particular video, I'll only be going through the strongest and the mainline move knight to e5 with a quick glance at, in my opinion, the second best move and a very interesting approach to countering the queen d6 Scandinavian g3. All the other moves I really encourage you to study at your own leisure. Just as a small piece of guidance, remember that they shouldn't be anywhere near as threatening as the two I'm about to show. So let's get started.
started with the main move, the strongest move, knight to e5. As we saw in the main line queen a5 Scandinavian, knight e5 is usually a very strong move and one of the best attempts for white to push the advantage. A lot of the patterns from the main line will repeat and a lot of the principles will remain the same. That's why, if you don't mind me repeating, I'd strongly encourage you to go back and watch the first video on the Scandinavian as well. You will just get so much more knowledge and you will again see so many patterns that are interwoven into most of the Scandinavian lines, be it queen a5, queen d6 or queen d8. Also, bloody hell, I wouldn't really mind more views on that thing, so, you know, go check it out. Anyway, as we saw in the mainline Scandinavian, whenever knight e5 is played, our first instinct should be what? Correct. Knight b to d7. The knight on e5 is a very big asset for white so it comes as no surprise that we should challenge it and when a time is right capture it. And again just with move 6 there's quite a range of good move 7 for white as well. As you can see on the right side of your screen these are knight to c4, bishop f4 and f4. With the e5 knight being attacked two times and defended only once something has to be done. The knight will have to be either once more defended or moved away. So let's first take a look at the most frequently played move, the mainline move, but not the sharpest one arguably, knight to c4 attacking the queen. The best way to approach it is to just calmly retreat the queen to the recently vacated c7. And now we arrive at another crossroads where white has a number of decent move 8 continuations. However, the good thing for us as black here is that some of the most natural developing moves that white can play in this position are some of the weakest and if white doesn't really know what he's doing the position will equalize almost instantly for example we may see people play a simple bishop d3 developing and preparing to castle kind of makes sense but now as black we're looking to counter strike and exploit the fact that the knight is a bit misplaced on c4 b5 and when the knight most likely retreats to e3 we play e5 exploding the center and the position is already equalized we are honestly not that far behind in development now from white and will now be able to go toe to toe with them with regards to peace activity and attacking chances. In a similar manner if we see something like bishop e3 also developing again b5 the e3 square is now unavailable for the knight so most likely we will see knight to d2 and now b4 strangling even more knight c to e4 knight d5 and again we're getting a very interesting dynamic game with roughly equal chances. That said if white does know what he's doing, black should obviously be prepared not to get overrun. The most precise and active way for white to play is to strike on the flank where he's got the most pieces, which is the queen side. Hence move 8 that I would recommend for white is a4. At the same time, black will now be looking to achieve his own main goal in the Scandinavian, which is to defuse the position by exchanging his defending pieces for white's attacking pieces. And because at the moment white's most prominent and attacking piece is situated on the queen side, we will also be moving our pieces there. Knight to b6, challenging the c4 knight. Exchanging knights isn't really in white's best interest, so he would be recommended to move the knight back to e5 where it's again very active. Bishop f5 developing before we play e6 so that the bishop doesn't get locked in. a5 squeezing the queen side and attacking the knight, and it returns to the natural d7 square where it can challenge the e5 knight yet again. Bishop f4 defending the knight and preparing preparing some possible trouble for the queen on c7 and now it is good time for black to release some tension. Knight takes, bishop takes attacking the queen, queen d7 is best, supporting the f5 bishop just in case and leaving the d8 square vacated in case rook wants to go there, a6 aiming to disrupt black's pawn chain on the queen side, and now after a pretty much forced b6 we see what the long term plan for white was. White now has control over the b7 square, the c6 pawn is an annoying weakness for black to handle, and black cannot really now castle queen side, whereas the typical king side castling will still take black a couple of more precious moves. White is enjoying a nice steady advantage of plus 0.8, the highest I could find in the main line with knight c4 on move 7. However, black shouldn't be too upset either, he just needs to figure out what to do with his kingside pieces. Apart from that, he's got his bishop, knight and queen out and develop, the rook can also quickly develop via d8, and he's also controlling a bunch of nice squares on the queen side with the b and c. Pawns. Coming back, let's take a look at another move 8 alternative for white, 
a very popular but only second best queen to f3. From white's point of view, it's rather logical to put the queen on f3 because the knight is most likely not coming back to f3 anyway. However, although this move does develop the queen very nicely, because we played c6 earlier on, it will not be as threatening. And now we follow up with the same plan that we just saw, knight to b6, aiming to exchange the knights. Again, white isn't interested in exchanging. Now the most active continuation is bishop f4 attacking the queen, queen d8 retreating, bishop e5 looking to defend the hanging d4 pawn and centralizing the bishop, and now it may be tempting for black to play bishop g4 attacking the queen, however I would not recommend it. Being behind in development, black shouldn't be too ambitious and should instead aim for more calm exchange provoking continuations. If the queen on f3 was attacked, it would simply move to g3 where it would create an annoying battery along with the bishop. Besides, the bishop on g4 will be vulnerable once the f6 knight is gone. So instead, much better to play bishop e6 double attacking the c4 knight. Yes, we have just immobilized the e pawn and have made the castling process more complicated, but in this position we are solid enough to have enough time to castle through fee and kettowing. Why does doesn't want exchanges, so knight simply retreats to e3, and now the advertised castling through Fianchetto begins with g6. Rook d1 developing, bishop g7 preparing to castle, h4 preparing to strike the Fianchetto structure, followed by h5, stopping the white's h-pawn dead in his tracks for now. What arises is a very interesting and dynamic position with chances for both sides, where white only has a slight edge due to higher peace activity of 0.5. And now let's have a look at a third and last interesting move 8 for white in this position, g3. Now allow me to reiterate here that g3 doesn't automatically mean that white is going to feign Keto as bishop to g2. It may as well also mean that he is simply preparing bishop bishop f4 to harass our queen on c7. So don't be surprised when despite g3, white can still move his bishop to e2 or d3. Regardless, our plan remains the same, knight b6. Knight e5 avoiding the exchange as we saw in the previous lines, and now bishop f5, also a very typical move in the Scandinavian. Now bishop g2 fianchettoing, and now here guys comes a very interesting point. In the positions with knight e5 and bishop g2, you should be very careful when playing a typical e6. In many Scandinavian lines, with knight e5, bishop f5, and e6 having been played, we see g4. If you remember, we talked about it in great detail in our first video on the mainline queen a5 Scandinavian. And usually, in these positions, after g4, our bishop would go to e4 where it would feel safe because it's defended once and attacked also only once. But in this position, because we have the white bishop on g2 overseeing e4, we cannot move our bishop to e4, it will simply get captured. That's why we'll have to move our bishop back to g6, where after h4 pushing forward, h6 creating space for the bishop, knight takes, pawn takes, will have a very shaky position. That is why coming back, when you see knight e5, bishop g2, please refrain from playing e6 and play g6 instead. Because if now g4 ever arrives, we can simply move our bishop back to e6 and feel safe. Anyway, after g6, we can expect white to castle and we can start preparing to castle ourselves with bishop g7. Further continuation may include a typical bishop f4 staring down our queen, in which case we have a great move, which is also made possible by g6, knight to h5. It forces the bishop to retreat, most likely to e3, and now, to avoid any silly g4 forks, we retreat the knight ourselves back to f6. Something like f4 expanding can be expected and followed by castling. We arrive at yet another interesting dynamic position with chances for both sides. The engine statement is that the position is roughly equal with just plus 0.2 edge for white. Okay. That will just about finish the knight c4 on move 7 saga. Now let's take a look at the second most popular, most intimidating, but honestly least effective move 7 for white, bishop f4. It provides the double attacked knight on e5 with more support and creates some nasty discovered attack opportunities. However, as black, we should remember that when we see bishop f4 on the board, in conjunction with knight e5, it's usually not as scary as it looks. In the position that we just saw, we diffused that move 
move with g6 and knight h5 attacking the bishop. Of course, in this position, knight h5 isn't available to us because there it will be captured by the queen, but we can very easily employ the same idea just coming from a different angle with knight to d5. And if you think that something outrageous like knight takes f7 seemingly attacking everything will help you, think again because after queen to e6 check, the tables are turned and it is white now who has a lot of stuff hanging. Instead, it's recommended to capture that pesky knight and now the queen recaptures, avoiding all the potential discovered attacks. Now white cannot really move his light squared bishop without hanging a g-pawn, so it's best to play f3. Never play f3, I know, but in this position it's okay, white isn't going to castle kingside anyway. Now black will be more than happy to exchange some more pieces, so knight takes, and it's better to recapture with a pawn because white will soon put his rook on d8, and it's nice to have an open file for it. Now here, I wouldn't actually recommend trading queen for now because it would allow white to develop his rook to d8 organically. Instead, an interesting queen to a5 check, and now the bishop cannot block because the e-pawn will be hanging with check, while both queen d2 and c3 blocking are possible. Considered slightly more accurate is queen d2 followed by the trade of queens. And now something natural like bishop f5 attacking c2, castles castles, will give us an equal position. The engine's verdict is plus 0.2. So as we can see, neither the mainline knight c4 nor the scary looking bishop f4 provide white with any substantial advantage. Now the question is, can the third most popular move also supporting knight on e5, f4, do any better? And the answer is yes. This is my favorite move 7 for white after knight e5 and let me show you why. First of all, it supports the e5 knight in such a manner that if captured, it automatically creates a devastating fork. And with the black knight staying on d7, the dark squared bishop on c8 will also never move. Now, playing a natural move like e6 while your light squared bishop is still on c8, especially in the Scandinavian, when you lag behind the development by definition, is not a great idea. And when we cannot play e6, what do we usually play instead? You guessed it, g6. However, unfortunately, white can still force us to play e6 if he plays bishop to c4, aiming at f7. Trying to be creative and not blocking with e6 but with knight to d5 will actually bring even more trouble after queen to f3, putting tremendous pressure on the d5 knight. We may as well try to call upon our other knight to provide sufficient defense with knight 7 to f6, but with g4 coming, aiming for g5 and dislodging the knight, it will be very difficult for black to hold the position together. So it's better to avoid all of these complications and just just cope with the fact that we will have a bad bishop for a while with e6. Queen e2, a most typical queen maneuver in the Scandinavian, preparing to castle long and push g4 and h4 as we will now see. Bishop g7 being kettering, bishop e3 developing, preparing to castle. And now, feeling that our knight on d7 doesn't really have much of a future, it will not capture the e5 knight anytime soon anyway, it's just better to cut our losses and move the knight to b6, preparing knight to d5. Now long castles, knight b to d5 as advertised and also attacking the knight on c3. White wouldn't really want the doubling of his pawns on the queen side, so a simple retreat like bishop to d2 works really well. Knight takes, bishop takes and now, not to just sit and defend the whole game, it's recommended that black does something active as well. b5 attacking the bishop, bishop retreats and we finally castle. Here the position becomes very venomous as white goes for the standard, single most effective plan of attacking with long castling, knight e5 and then h4 and g4, something that I'm reiterating for a second video in a row and something that I cannot stress enough. If you want to beat black in the Scandinavian, in most positions this is the setup that you play. At the same time, black will also try his luck with his own attack with a5 b4, however his pieces are not as well developed, hence are not as well poised for the attack as white's pieces are. White stands clearly better here with the the advantage of plus one. So to summarize, when comparing the three main moves, knight c4, bishop f4, f4, we found out that the most efficient way of handling these positions is f4, 
followed by the standard plan of long castling and pushing the kingside pawns. Knight c4 is arguably second best, creating balanced positions where white just has a slight edge, whereas with bishop f4 it can be quite easy for black to actually equalize. Now let's move on to our final subject of discussion, what happens if white does not play knight e5 on move 6 but goes for a totally different approach with g3 instead. It's true that it is not as effective as knight e5 can be but black also has to be careful. We're going to follow up with the rather typical bishop to f5, we've seen that a million times before, and now it kind of depends on what white wants to achieve first. Does he want to free and Keto with bishop first, or does he want to threaten the queen with bishop to f4? Both of these moves are equally decent, so let's look at them both. If white decides to free and Keto, I recommend to play the small prophylactic h6. The reason is, even in the free and Keto setup, the white knight will jump into e5 regardless a lot of the time. So this way we're preparing an exit square for the f5 bishop just in case g4, h4 and h5 get played afterwards. And luckily for us, in this Fianchetto setup we just have enough time to afford to play this kind of prophylactic move. Now castles the typical e6 and now we will likely see the development of the last minor piece onto its most active square, bishop f4. The queen naturally retreats to d8 followed by again a very very typical queen e2, although this time we have already castled kingside. Bishop d6, we're looking to exchange pieces because we're black in the Scandinavian, aren't we? Knight e5, preventing the exchange and putting the knight onto this infamous square, followed by castling. Again, another very interesting position with chances for both sides, where white stands slightly better because of his superior development. For black, something like knight b to d7 should be expected to try to relieve some pressure in the center and exchange some more pieces, and white should, as usual, go for g4, h4, g5 to try to completely obliterate black. The position is plus 0.7. And to conclude our video, the last move we're going to be looking at is if white decides to play bishop f4 immediately. And really, if you attentively watched my first video and this video as well, the moves in this position will not surprise you at all. If anything, they should be quite automatic. Queen goes back to d8, queen e2 preparing to castle long, and d6. Now, white may as well castle long immediately, but I'm offering you a slightly better alternative with knight h4 attacking the f5 bishop. And this is one of the few cases where I would actually recommend looking into bishop g4. So f3 would be the best decision, again, we're castling long anyway, so who cares. Bishop h5 retreating, and now castles long. Again, black would really like to exchange some pieces, so knight to d5 forcing the exchange looks like a no-brainer. Knight takes, pawn takes, the typical g4 push, bishop back to g6, knight takes, pawn takes, and this is where we're going to stop. The position in its assessment is like many we have seen before. White has the bishop pair, a safer king, slightly superior development, hence white is slightly better, with the evaluation plus 0.7. At the same time, I don't think that black should scoff at the opportunity to castle on himself when a time is right, and try to come up with a couple of threats along the semi-open C and H files. And that is going to be it, my favorite unintentional gambiteers. If you found this rambling useful, please like and subscribe, it helps me out massively, and let me know in the comments which moves that I haven't mentioned are really getting on your nerves. And as per usual, may all your moves on the chessboard be exclam moves and have an excellent day. Love you guys, see you in the next one.